I want to introduce myself. My name is uh, Lloyd Altan. On behalf of the Bronx County Historical Society, I want to welcome you to our historical walking tour of Mott Haven. Uh, and Mott Haven itself is one of the most historic neighborhoods in the Bronx. And one of the reasons why it's one of the most historic neighborhoods in the Bronx is because this is where you find the origin of the Bronx. The Indians that lived here before the coming of the Europeans, believe it or not, were the Manhattan Indians. There were no such things as Bronx Indians. They lived here. They also lived in the northern part of Manhattan Island across the way. The very first European settler to come was a fellow who was born in Sweden, who lived in the Netherlands in Amsterdam, taught himself navigation, and became a merchant sea captain and eventually in 1639 decided to get married and to start life anew on the farm in the frontier in the colony of what was then called New Netherlands. His name was Jonas Bronck and he came over here in 1639, brought with him his wife and several servants because he was a wealthy man. He brought with him some Germans, some Danish and some Dutch servants. So they came here and they settled, and we will see the spot that they settled on. Consequently, you could say at the very beginning of the Bronx, the Bronx was ethnically mixed. Nevertheless, Jonas Bronx lived until the year 1643. He was 43 years old at the time, and in those days, that was rather old, and he died. And over the years, uh, the land was owned by different people until 1665. In 1665, the land was purchased by two brothers, Richard and Lewis Morris. They were originally born in Monmouthshire in England, right on the border of Wales, and uh, in the town of Tintern. And they moved to Barbados in the West Indies, had a plantation there. Then one of them, Richard, came up to the Bronx, purchased the land that had been owned by Jonas Bronx, and promptly died. Um, his brother, Lewis, then came up to claim the legacy and also to hold the land in charge for a very young son, uh, na also named Lewis Morris. That young son, Lewis Morris, uh, became a very important person because that Lewis Morris, and you have to be very careful here because the Morrises have a Lewis in every generation and it's very difficult to keep track of them. But the very first Lewis Morris who was born in the Bronx uh, in the land that uh, they eventually called Morrisania, uh became the, the first native-born chief justice of the colony of New York. And he also became the first royal governor of the colony of New Jersey. His son, by some strange coincidence called Louis Morris, uh, became a speaker of the New York Colonial Assembly and later on a judge of the Admiralty Court, and he was a judge of the Admiralty Court during the French and Indian War. Now, the Admiralty Court decided uh, how cargoes of captured ships should be disposed of, so it was a very important position. And late in his life, during the French and Indian War, where he, when he was, couldn't get down to New York City to hold court there, some of the courts, about five of the sessions of the court just before he died, were held right here in the Bronx. Uh, the captains complained it was very inconvenient. Uh, nevertheless, uh, his son, he had several children, he had two wives, not at the same time, uh, and he had several children. Uh, one of them was named, guess what? <laughs> Lewis Morris. That Lewis Morris became a general of the New York State Militia during the American Revolution. He was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He became a United States Senator from the state of New York, uh, excuse me, a, a, um, a New York State Senator from what was then Westchester County. Uh, and his brother, also a son of the Lewis, the uh, judge of the Admiralty Court, his brother was Richard Morris. Richard Morris became a justice, the chief justice of the state of New York. And their half-brother, who was, of course, the son of the second wife, was Governor Morris. Governor Morris was one of the chief framers of the Constitution of the United States. Uh, the Constitution of the United States is written in his style because he had the task of getting all of the resolutions of the Constitutional Convention together and putting it all into some coherent whole 
for a final document. So the Constitution of the United States is written in his style, and he is known as the penman of the Constitution. Louis Morris was also the American minister to France during the Reign of Terror. He was also a United States senator from the state of New York, and very late in life, in his last year of his life, he became the very first chairman of the Erie Canal Commission. The Erie Canal was his idea. Gouverneur Morris's son was Gouverneur Morris II. Gouverneur Morris II was the vice president of the New York and Harlem River Railroad and is also responsible for building the railroad into this area and, and in addition started selling off the Morris legacy. Now there are many other Morrises that are important in the history of the Bronx and I don't want to get you too confused with them, but suffice it to say, the Morrises held land in the Bronx until 1956. Now, in 1841, this land that we are standing on now was purchased from the Morrises by a fellow by the name of Jordan L. Mott. Jordan L. Mott was an industrialist. He, was, he owned an iron foundry, and he wanted to establish the iron foundry here in the Bronx. He bought all the land south of 152nd Street and west of 3rd Avenue. And he decided to call the area Mott Haven. And when some people went to Gouverneur Morris II and said to him, hey, did you hear what Jordan L. Mott did? He's changing the name of Morrisania to Mott Haven. And Gouverneur Morris II is supposed to have said, now I suppose the next thing he'll do, he'll change the name of the Harlem River to the Jordan. It's an old joke. <laughs> Nevertheless, Jordan L. Mott encouraged industry. It was he who laid out the streets in the area and decided to sell the various plots of land to different industrial concerns. So he established his iron foundry here. He also encouraged other concerns to open up. And it's he who created this as an industrial center. So consequently, Mott Haven became a heavily industrialized place and you will see that even today there is a lot of industry and a lot of warehousing in Mott Haven. Naturally if you have industry you have to have workers and indeed workers came and in the 1840s the people who came to work in the industry were the Irish immigrants and so the Irish were the first really great European ethnic group to come and inhabit Mott Haven. And you'll see some remnants of the Irish inhabitants of Mont Haven here as well. Different other ethnic groups came as well. You will find, that, uh, find some evidence of, uh, of Germans, some evidence of Jews, some evidence of other people who lived in Mont Haven. Uh, and certainly by the 20th century, it was definitely ethnically mixed. In the late 19th century and early 20th century, this area on 138th Street became a center for lumber yards and coal yards. And perhaps because of that, uh, it also became a center for manufacturing pianos. There were a lot of factories that manufactured pianos in this area, and in fact, at that time, the Bronx was the piano capital of the world. You could say the Bronx at that point hit the, hit the right key, all right? Now, in the 19th century, the Bronx was part of Westchester County. Almost all of Mott Haven and this entire area was part of the township of Westchester, and indeed almost all of the Bronx was part of the township of Westchester. With the coming of industry, with the coming of the railroad in this area, the population grew to such a great extent that the part of the township of Westchester that was west of the Bronx River was cut off and created into the township of West Farms. In 1856, the southwestern portion of the township of West Farms was cut off and created into a new township of Morrisania. Now, in 1874, the population grew to such a great extent, as well as the population of New York coming up further, that the entire Bronx, west of the Bronx River, was annexed to New York City. So by 1874, 